Hey, welcome back to my office. <laughs> and uh, so now we're going to do a goodness of fit test, multinomial probability distribution. So, you know, I like using ChatGPT, and if you use ChatGPT, make sure you use the paid version. Uh, the free version produces a couple, of, I've seen it produce a couple of errors. Uh, but the paid version has been great. Like occasionally we'll have like, is this really what it's supposed to be? And it's like, oh, actually, yeah, you're seeing it that way. Then this is what, but paid version has been super on point. So this is when I asked ChatGPT, what is a multinomial probability distribution? Even if you just look at this word here, you have multi, which is many, and you have nomial, which makes me think of name, many names. And uh, we already learned that this is going to be categorical, right? And so maybe this is many categories. And indeed, that's what it tells us right here, multiple categories. So we've seen uh, binomial distributions previously in this course where we talked about successes or failures. And a multinomial distribution applies to experiments with more than two categories, right? We're learning that, you know, this is categorical stuff that we're gonna be taking a look at. So multinomial is experiments with more than two categories, such as, e.g. means uh, such as, I think, you know? So here, we could ask ChatGPT, and I'm gonna do a new chat and then just make this a little bit bigger. And when people, people use the uh, abbreviation, abbreviation, E dot G, what does that mean? And I think it means example. Um, like this, or the abbreviation EG stands for Exempli Gratia. Gratia, I don't know how to say that. If I wanted to know how to say that, I could come here and put it in and define, and then I could, but there's no speaker icon. Maybe if I don't have define there, and I just have it like that, nothing. And if I do pronounce, pronunciation, uh, here, I've got a little video where maybe it would tell me how to do that. And let's hear it, why not? First grade is a magical age. Okay, so that that, okay. <laughs> that was a weird wi video. Exemply gratia. Exemply gratia. So which means, for example, uh, you should eat more fruits, e.g. apples, oranges, bananas, exemply gratia. So there you go. For example, multinomial probability distribution is a journalization of the binomial probability, the binomial distribution that models the probability of outcomes for experiments where there are more than two possible outcomes, more than two possible outcomes. It is used when each trial in an experiment results in one of multiple categories or events, and the goal is to find the probability of observing a specific combination of outcomes across multiple trials. So multiple categories, unlike the binomial distribution, which only has two possible outcomes, success or failure, the multinomial distribution applies to experiments with more than two categories, e.g., for example, exempli gratia, exempli gratia, gratia, rolling a die with six faces or conducting a survey with four response options, right? That's multiple categories. A survey with four response options. Multinomial, multiple names, multiple categories, right? A uh, fixed number of trials. You conduct the experiment a fixed number of times and each trial is independent. So like if I'm asking people, you know, which, uh, you know, uh, which soda do you like at the store? A survey with four responses and I have four choices for them. Each trial is independent. So if I ask one person and they tell me something, it doesn't influence uh, the next person I ask. And so you could think about that because there would be situations where if you ask somebody something, it would influence. Like if you ask one person and they're with a friend, uh, that one person's response might influence the friend's response. And the, that person, the friend might be like, oh, my friend said this, I'm gonna say that too. So you might wanna, uh, you know, uh, when you create your experiment, only ask people, you know, where they aren't together. Uh, so you conduct the experiment a fixed number of times. Also, probability of each outcome. For each category, the probability of that outcome happening in a single trial remains constant throughout the trials, right? So every time you ask somebody something, the probability of uh, the, an outcome for each category, right? Probability of a certain outcome uh, is uh, constant throughout the trials. Example, suppose you're all six-sided die 10 times. The possible outcomes categories are the six numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six. And the multinomial distribution can calculate the probability of rolling each number a certain number of times, rolling a one three times, a two once, and so on, 
right? So that's a multinomial. You might want to pause the video here and just read that and reflect upon that to let that sink in and come up with your own understanding of that as opposed to, uh, you know, me just talking all the time and you listening. Pause the video now and just read that again and reflect upon it. I'm going to do the same thing. You ready? All right, so I just read through it and reflected upon it. I hope you did the same, and that's part of you learning how to learn, right? You gotta, you gotta work the material. You gotta think about it. You can't just sit here and passively listen, but occasionally pause the video and make some notes or pause the video and read it yourself and think about it or look up a word like multinomial and try to break it apart. Multiple nomial names, multiple categories. Right. And, uh, you know, thinking about that in relation to binomial, which is two names or two categories, success or failure like these. This is how you learn. And then by working the material and breaking things apart like this, you start to own it. You start to own it so that when you see multinomial or binomial somewhere, you're thinking nomial names by two success, failure, multi, many. Right, multiple categories. So this is like kind of an extension of binomial uh, distribution. Uh, it's multinomial distribution. Let's keep going. The goodness of fit test, multinomial probability distribution. So we're going to get a little information about that, and then we're going to get here to this problem. So we have three slides of kind of like this is how you do it, and then we're going to get to the problem, and we're going to see that in action. So we'll just read through these, then we'll do the problem, and then we'll come back to these. State the null and alternative hypotheses. So that would be like step one. The population follows a multinomial distribution with specified probabilities for each of the K categories. And uh, K, you know, you might say, well, what's K? Where's K? Or you might also just chalk that up to, uh, you know, K is just going to be uh, notation that's used to specify how many categories. Because remember, multinomials, multiple names or multiple categories, and it's multiple categories. Here you see that. So we're going to have K categories. So that's probably multiple categories. So the population follows a multinomial distribution with specified probabilities for each of the K categories. So that would be the null hypothesis. The alternative, the population does not follow multinomial distribution with specified probabilities for each of the K categories. So if you look at like our little, uh, you know, our little example here, our little example is here are the probabilities for different categories, product A, product B, product C, <clears throat> and the market share that each of these own. <clears throat> And so that is like, hey, these are all going to stay constant, maybe just speculating, hypothesizing, thinking about this. So the population has specified probabilities for each category. And then, you know, the population doesn't follow a multinomial distribution with specified probabilities for each category. And then we select a random sample and record the observed frequency for each of the K categories. So we do a random sample. So I'm just going to highlight that and we record observed frequencies, right, for each of the K categories. So we're actually going to like test it with a random sample. And then if uh, the null is true, compute the expected frequency. OK, so we compute the expected frequency. Here we go right here, just highlighting some terms. So starting to get familiar with the term in each category by multiplying uh, the category probability by the sample size. And so expected frequency is multiply category probability by sample size. OK, we'll see that and compute the test statistics. So we're learning about test statistics and test statistics are used with a critical value. And that's the critical value approach or the p-value approach. So eventually we're going to create this right here. And you can pause the video and just kind of reflect on that to solve this right here and determine whether or not we accept or reject the null hypothesis. And, uh, and anyhow, we're just reading about this. And so part of creating this here is having a test statistic. And so here's the test. Uh, here's the critical value right here. And then this is the test statistic, right? So this is a statistic we're testing against the critical value. And uh, this is called the critical value approach. We're using chi, chi-square, uh, to get our critical value. And then we also have the p-value approach. And so this is going to be result in rejecting the null hypothesis, which is like, hey, this is the current state of things. This is where equality resides. It resides in the null hypothesis. It's the current state. These are the current market shares. And is that still the case after we introduce a new product C? Does pro new product C alter those market shares? 
And since we reject, we reject this null hypothesis, we see that, yeah, indeed, the new product C does alter the market share. So you really got to get in here and kind of tear this stuff up and think about it. And so uh, compute the test statistic. And so here we have F, which is the observed frequency. And so these are like just, you know, important little terms. So I'm just going to like highlight that. And I can't highlight that because this PowerPoint presentation is a bit odd and they had to do things with images sometimes. And so that's an image. So there's observed frequency and then there's also expected frequency. So I'll just put that there. And, uh, and that's close enough. Maybe I'll bring that over just a little bit and bring this one over just a touch. Just bring it over just a touch, just touch. That's fine, do it like that. And then just bring this one out here like this. There we go. All right, so there's observed frequency and expected frequency for category I and then the number of categories. Hey, there we finally see our K. It's the number of categories. And then we have a K minus one degrees of freedom. So I highlighted that and, uh, and it has the chi square distribution. I'm glad I know how to say chi now. I was saying chai for a while. <laughs> I kind of like chai. And so we have the p-value approach to reject. I don't really like these rules. I like drawing this diagram just to kind of see it. And then when I see it, I can figure it out. And uh, alpha is the level of significance level and there are k minus one degrees of freedom. So here's our problem. Here's our example. A market share study conducted by Scott Marketing Research has identified that the market for product X is shared by three companies. So product X is shared by companies A, B, and C. Company C is going to introduce a new and improved product to replace its current, I'm just making sure I'm recording, uh, replace its current product in the market. It wants Scott Marketing Research, whoops, uh, to determine whether the new product will alter the market share for the three companies. Using the historical market shares, we have multinomial probability distribution. Multinomial, multiple names, multiple categories, and then this is the probability distribution of those three different categories. See, statistics has a way of making things sound really complicated. And uh, I think it's a little bit pretentious and ostentatious and it makes it unapproachable, but we're really just talking about the probabilities for three different categories of three things, right? In the market share. And so this is known as a probability distribution. How are the probabilities distribu distributed amongst these three categories? Well, you could say three categories or multiple categories and multinomial. So here we have multiple names, multiple categories, and this is, the prob this is how the probability is distributed across those three categories, multinomial probability distribution. Kind of cool. Uh, so we have product A, product B, product C, 30% market share, 50% market share, 20% market share. So Scott Marketing conducts a sample study using a consumer panel, just 200 customers, right? Uh, and so a hypothesis test can be used to determine whether the new product of company C is likely to change the historical market shares of the three companies. And uh, we will use a 0.05 level of significance. Our alpha will be 0.05. So here we go. Uh, and then I put all this into ChatGPT just because I'm super interested to see how ChatGPT Chat GPT explained it. So we're going to see that here. And then we're also going to see how the book explained it, which I think ChatGPT actually does a better job than the book. And, uh, and just so you can get a visual on the conclusion. So here is like the historical market shares in blue for company slash product A, company slash product B, and company uh, slash product C. So here's the historical market shares blue and then after the new product is red. And so here you could see uh, they had this much, but then they went down after C released a new product. So they lost market share. They had this much, but then they went down a little bit after C released new product C. And then they were here and then they released a new product and they went up. So the market responded favorably and they're selling more stuff and they have more market share. So that's, that's the end conclusion that we're gonna get to. To solve the goodness of fit test example for the multinomial probability distribution, now we understand that phrase, shown in the image, we can proceed step by step. So problem setup, there's three companies, A, B, and C are sharing the market for product X. And to get this solved here, what I did is I just downloaded this, this uh, PowerPoint presentation, this presentation as a PowerPoint presentation. Then I uploaded this entire presentation to ChatGPT. You could attach a file. And then I said, can you please solve the Scott Marketing Research example and explain it to me? 
And so this is what ChatGPT pumped out, which is amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> it's totally amazing. <laughs> Historical market share, so, you know, A, B, C. And then new product. Company C introduces a new product, and Scott Marketing wants to determine. So they do a sample of 200 customers and level significance 0.05. Null hypothesis. Uh, state your hypothesis. Step one. The market shares remain the same after the new product is introduced, meaning the proportions are A, B, and C. So that's the null. It's the current state. It's the status quo. Nothing changes. It makes me want to go get that one little thing we have. Let me find it. Hold on. Okay, cool. I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm doing good. <laughs> I uh, have added it to our terminology page, which is at the top of our... Hold on, i got to get a drink of water. Okay, so I put together a little terminology page here, and our terminology page now has uh, the little heuristic uh, rule of thumb. A heuristic is a rule of thumb, and I'm gonna add to this heuristic. Right here, I'm gonna uh, put equality, right? Because equality is also uh, going to be something that we have in the little hypothesis. You know, that's the way I've always seen it. And I think I've read that somewhere that equality is always in the, I did read that somewhere. I can't remember where, but equality is always in the null hypothesis. And I'll just make this like a light purple. There we go. And so I'm going to uh, copy this. That light purple is not all that pretty of a color. Let's go with a light blue. There we go. How's that one? That's better. That's fine. So I'm going to copy all this and we're looking at our, creating our hypothesis here. So I'm just going to drop this in here and maybe I could do that by moving this over to this side. And then I could take this one here and I could just make it all smaller uh, just so we have that reminder handy. And uh, there we go. Oh, too far. There we go. How about that? Like that. It's perfect. So when we actually, you know what? I like it like this better because we kind of read right to left. And, uh, and so that makes more sense to my mind. And um, perfect. That's perfect. So here, the null hypothesis, the market shares remain the same after the new product is introduced. So nothing changed. It's the current state. It's the status quo. There's no change. And we have equality in our null hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis is the market shares have changed, meaning at least one of the proportions is different. So here we go. Calculate the expected frequencies. And if you remember, we read about expected frequencies here. And no, we read about them here. Expected frequencies multiplying the category probability by the, the sample size. And so if this is the category probability of A, B, and C, and this is the sample size, then we're expecting to have 60 people out of 200 want product A, 100 people out of 200 want product B, and 40 people out of 200 want product C. That's what we're expecting when we ask 200 customers which product they want, because this is the current market share. It's the current way customers are buying stuff. 30% want A, 50% want B, 20% want C. So when we multiply these together, we figure out out of 200, how many, what's the expected frequencies. And then we have our observed frequency from the new data. And so really A, you know, 48 customers out of 200 wanted it. B, 98 customers out of 200 wanted it. And C, 54 customers out of 200 wanted it. So here's expected frequencies, here's observed frequencies. And if you go back up and you look through our notes, uh, when we were looking through our notes, we had stuff about expected and observed. And so I'm just looking to see where, oh, here we go. A random sample, record the observed frequency and then compute the expected frequency. So we're assuming that the probability distribution, the current state is true. So that's just an assumption that this is really the market share, you know, that it is uh, 30, 50, 20. And, uh, and then once, you know, making that assumption, uh, we calculate the expected frequency. We do that mul multiplying the category probability by the sample size. And so that seems a little bit obtuse or it seems obtuse or, I don't know, a little bit confusing when we first read it. And, uh, but now that we see it in action, it's like, oh, that makes sense, right? Like this is what we expect out of 200, they each get a certain percentage of the market share. And then we have what was actually observed. And you can see that A went down a uh, fair amount and B went down just little and C went up, uh, you know, a lot proportionally speaking. And uh, so, yeah, you could calculate the percentage change on all those if you wanted. Um, and then we have here use the chi, the chi square formula to compute the test statistic. 
And so I'm wondering if they gave us the test statistic formula. I think they did, right? We have here f minus e all over e and square the f minus e. And so here is the observed minus expected, square it, and then you know divide it by expected and then add all those up. And so here we have observed minus expected. And just notice the difference in notation. So I'm just going to copy this. And here's the textbook notation. And, uh, ooh, that's really dark. And, uh, and so the textbook talks about it like that, uh, F minus E. And ChatGPT does O minus E. I like this better. Like that looks a little bit more relatable and understandable to me because O makes me think observed and E makes me think expected, but F, I don't know, right? Doesn't do it for me. So here, let's calculate each company and you do that for each company. So chi-square formula, test statistics. So calculate it for each company. We go boom, boom, boom. And then we're gonna add all those up. Boom, 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 and we get 7.34. And if you look at our little diagram, our test statistic is 7.34. And this is the critical value against which we're benchmarking it. So even here, like at 0.05 probability, 0.05 probability, right? 0.05 probability. If how many degrees of freedom? How do we calculate our degrees of freedom? So we could come back here and look for where do we calculate degrees of freedom? It's K minus one. And with K, we have three categories. We have market, product, company, A, B, and C. Uh, we have company, product, A, B, and C, so, so three. So we calculate our uh, degrees of freedom, k minus one, three minus one is gonna be two degrees of freedom. And then I'm always relieved when I look down and I'm still recording, I'm like, oh good. <laughs> Cause sometimes I turn it off and then I like just go straight back. <laughs> and I, I just have that concern, like did I push record? So here in my downloads, we have the chi. And so we're gonna bring up chi and here's chi, the chi square distribution, probability distribution. And we'll make this a little bit bigger so we could see it a little bit easier. Come on, come on, come on, come on. And here's chi-square, we have two degrees of freedom. And so the area in the upper tail. So a question I had is why if we are doing, and so why if we are doing a null hypothesis, which is, which is this, which is equality. So here's the null hypothesis, it's got equality in it. Why is it not two-tail test? Right? Why is it not a two tail test? Because you have one tail if it goes too far in the positive direction and one tail if it goes too far in the negative direction. If the difference was too far this way or too far that way, it seems like you want to test that, right? And so I asked ChatGPT that and ChatGPT said, ah, it actually said, very good question. <laughs> and, uh, and its response was that because you're squaring everything here, right, we square this, the differences are all gonna be positive. So we're just testing this against the right tail. And so that's why here you just have a right tail test, which means that 5% is just gonna be in here. So when we look at our table, we're not saying, you know, some here and some here and doing a tail, you know, taking our alpha and dividing it by two and doing a two tail test because with chi-square to get that test statistic for by multinomial, multinomial probability distribution, then we've got two here and at 0.05 is 5.991. So it's two degrees of freedom and the area in the upper tail, our alpha is 0.05. So we're at 5.991 is our critical value. So we have our test statistic. We have our critical value. We have our p-value for our level of significance. And now all we need is like this right here, the p-value for 7.34. Well, two degrees of freedom, if we look for where would 7.34 fall, it's gonna be right before 7.37, right? So it's really gonna be like, it's between 0.05 and 0.025 or 5% and 2.5%, and it's closer to 2.5%. It's like right there, it's right there. So that's going to be like 2.4% uh, or 0.024. But I just write the notation here like this, it's between 0.05 and 0.025, which means it's less than 0.05, so whether you use the p-value approach or the critical value approach with chi-square test statistic, this is the critical value, you're either one, you're in the reject area. You're up here, you went too far. <laughs> the differences were too great. So you reject the null hypothesis that you know this is the market share and you, uh, by implication, are not rejecting, statisticians would say, confusingly, as opposed to just saying accepting or realizing but uh, you are not rejecting the alternative hypothesis. I think about it as accepting the alternative hypothesis. 
And uh, who cares <laughs> what statisticians would actually say? The probabilities are not this. So you're saying the probabilities are not that. So you have proven with 95% confidence uh, that that's your confidence level, that's your confidence coefficient. You can see that notation here. You've proven with 95% confidence that the introduction of a new product shifted market shares. So company C, uh, after that test, might say, great, let's roll out this new product. And you could really see how this is useful to businesses <laughs> to be able to have you know, data like this to make decisions. So we get our test statistic, and then we determine the critical value. And so here it's 5.91 and we got 5.991, you know, and so they got 5.991 also at alpha 0.05 and two degrees of freedom. So how to do that and you make a decision and then they, you know, is this, this is always like in your head, you're just kind of picturing this. You're like, it's a right tailed test. And since my critical value is less than my test statistic, I'm going to reject. That doesn't work for me. I just don't think in those terms, so I draw the picture. <laughs> I kind of like draw, drawing the picture. Or, you know, your test statistics greater than your critical value or reject in the hypothesis. So the conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, is at the 0.05 level of significance, there is a significant evidence to suggest that market shares for companies A, B, and C have changed after the introduction of the new product by company C. So here's where I asked uh, ChatGPT that question. And it's like, this is a great question. <laughs> I really like that. And, uh, and I asked it like, you know, why is this uh, just a right-tailed test as opposed to a left-tailed test? And I, you know, a two-tailed test. So I explained this to you already, but you can pause the video right here and you can read ChatGPT's response. And you can also pause the video right here and read the rest of ChatGPT's response. And, uh, and then here is this picture that we've already done. You can pause the video and you can look at it. And now for these next one, two, three, four, five, six slides, we're going to see how the textbook explained it. And I got to warn you in advance that this isn't as good as ChatGPT. It's not as good, nor is it as good as everything you've already seen in this video. But it's kind of cool just to reinforce and also see how the, the textbook goes through it. So here's our null hypothesis and our alternative hypothesis. And, uh, and these are the probabilities a customer purchases company A, B, or C product. Pause the video, take it in, think about it. And then here's expected frequencies and observed frequencies, right? So again, multiplying the sample size by the current probability market shares. And there are the probability market shares, just as a reminder, I've just put those in. The textbook didn't organize it in this logical of a fashion. I had to rearrange slides to get it so you could really quickly synthesize it. And that's part of learning to learn is knowing how to put information together so you can be like, you know, expected, observed. I want to see those side by side, right? And so then when you have these, uh, you do your test statistic and here they are calculating the test statistic. Though they made a mistake, <laughs> and that should not be 51, it should be 54, and I can't change that because this is an image, so there's no clicking in there and editing it. And so it's kind of cool to see that, you know, the everybody makes mistakes, even if you're like the smartest person in the world, teaching at the best universities and writing text, textbooks on statistics, mistakes get made, that's life. You should know that. But at the same time, it's weird that humans have a hard time owning that or recognizing it or admitting it and just being able to say, I don't know, I'm not perfect, I'll learn it, I'll figure it out. But that's that confident, that's that earnest, humble confidence, right? You're humble, humble, you're earnest, you're confident, there's self-efficacy, you can go figure it out, you have no problem saying what you know, this is what I know, you have no problem saying when you're uncertain or when you don't know, and you also have no problem saying, and I'll go do my very best to figure it out, and I'm pretty good at figuring stuff out. Like, I think it's kind of amazing, I keep finding errors, like, and I'm just new to this, I'm new to this. So here is uh, the p-value approach and the way the book presents that, and here's the critical value approach, and I should highlight that, I like highlighting so I can just really quickly see what we're doing there. And there's the critical value approach. And, uh, and the critical value for the test statistic is 5.991. 5.991 is your critical value. It's like, are you bigger or smaller than that? It's critical, it's the critical value. And this is like the test statistic, right? Uh, and you're seeing if the test statistics on which side, again, statistics, they're not, they have a lot of jargon. It's a whole new language. And I think it's over jargonized. I just made that up. Uh, yeah, that word jargonized. It's over jargonized and it makes it unapproachable and confusing and that's too bad. 
uh, because really, you know, if it was presented properly to me when I was an undergraduate in a more approachable manner, I would have understood it more and maybe I would have enjoyed it more and maybe would have been able to use it more. But they do themselves a disservice by over jargonizing it and making it uh, a little bit ostentatious and pretentious. And so here's a graph of all that. Hey, that was 30 minutes well spent. I enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something, uh, not only about statistics, but also about life and about learning. Um, you're doing great. If you're watching these videos, uh, I'm really proud of you. And more importantly, you should be proud of yourself. And you should know that by spending time with something, you get good at it. And oh my gosh, I saw this video today. Let me find it. You ready? Go check this video out. Hold on. All right, here's the video. And uh, it's this 10 year old and he's at a concert and he has a sign that says, let me play with you. So the band is like, all right, you know how to play guitar, come up here. And then he just totally shreds. <laughs> so uh, I think the point that I was going to make with that is that, uh, you know, if you uh, spend time doing something, you get good at it. And that's a really important thing to learn and know that you just got to keep doing stuff. And when you keep doing something, you, you just get better and better and better. And so you might check out this video here, Jake Collison. I uh, can't believe this happened. Ten-year-old asks band at festival to let him play guitar. And, um, and then also that uh, aligns with research. And so there's um, Malcolm Gladwell, Outliers. And he wrote a book about how do people get good at something. And basically, it you, know, you, you have to do something for 10 years, a couple hours every day, for like four hours every day. And, uh, and you need a good coach. So not only that, but the book is Outliers. I don't know why it's bringing me to that. But uh, anyhow, that's, uh, and then you also just need grit. And so um, Angela Duckworth, you know, has a great talk on grit. Angela Duckworth, Ted Grit. So you could Google that. And, uh, and so here is like grit, the power of persuasion. So watch that. And then this book, uh, I think it'd be okay to read. I would, I would first, instead, I would go to Audible, and these are great books to listen to. And at Audible, this is like where you can listen to books. It's Amazon's book thing. You could get Grit by Angela Duckworth, so that one's really good. And then you could also get Be Useful by Arnold Schwarzenegger. That's really great. And then you could also get, after those two, Smarter, Faster, Better. Uh, that's really great. And those are three really good recommendations. But all those are going to reinforce for you, like, how's a 10-year-old play guitar that well? Like, you know, he's probably been doing it for five years when since he was five or, you know, maybe younger. And he probably practices several hours a day. He's passionate. And this guy just tears it up like he's professional. So uh, that's a good little note to end on because the more you do something, and I'm proud of you because you're sticking with it, you're watching these videos, the more you do something, the better you're going to get at it, and you're doing it. You're just watching these videos, you're working the material, and, and now you know multinomial is many names or many categories, and it's like binomial, which is the success-failure thing. But here we're dealing with multiple categories, and those categories in this example were like product A, product B, product C, product company A, product company B, product company C, and their market shares. And then we did a test to see if after new products introduced, if it shifts the market shares. And we had, when we did that test, we had our expected and we had our observed. And so here's our expected frequency and here are our observed frequencies. And so then we were able to calculate our test statistic. And I like this formula much better, but notice here we're working the material and I feel like this has to be the same size as that. So it like it's more comparable. But here we're working the material and understanding it and not just be like, being like, I got to memorize F minus E, but being like, oh, I really like O minus E better. And then we add all those up, we get our test statistic, and then we get, you know, at the 0.05 level of significance and two degrees of freedom. We have, uh, you know, our critical value is this, and this is the test statistic we calculated. And then at two degrees of freedom, we could see it's in this range. And now we can evaluate all that and we can reject it. It's not that complicated. But, you know, for a week's worth of work can really confirm for a company whether or not they should really invest in releasing a new product or, you know, if they should save all that effort and time, it can really make a difference and help people understand like, yeah, let's invest. Look, here we have the statistics, the data. We're making data driven decisions, decisions that are driven by data, data driven decisions. 
and we have a good probability with 95% confidence this is going to shift market share. Like that's super compelling. And then you make more money and then you can do cool stuff. And that's because you have gained knowledge to become, you know, more effective. And that's pretty cool. And so it's not just like ugh statistics, it's like yay, money. <laughs> right? Yay, uh, going on a cruise this summer. You know, that's what it comes down to. So that's pretty cool. All right, catch you in the next video.